Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first installment of our new lecture series for fellows in training. I am Claire Style with the ACC Minnesota chapter. And before we get started, I just wanted to share a couple of our upcoming events and go over a few items before introducing our speaker. So I just wanted to let you know that the Midwest Cardiovascular Forum is returning to an in-person event um, this October. 29th and 30th in downtown Minneapolis. Our registration is now open and we are taking uh, submissions for poster abstracts. Those are due September 8th if you'd like to participate in the poster contest. Um, those whose poster abstracts are, are excuse me, accepted uh, will get a free registration to the event. And the next installment of this lecture series is coming up on September 13th. So I hope you'll register. I'll post that uh, registration link in the chat in a little bit. And uh, if you have any questions, technical questions throughout the presentation, you're welcome to message those to me, ACCMN, in the um, Zoom chat. Otherwise, uh, Dr. Larson will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. And uh, without further ado, I'll let um, our speaker introduce herself. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Claire. Um, so my name is Katherine Larson. I'm currently one of the Advanced Imaging Fellows at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I um, was a Chief Fellow there last year. I uh, have one more year of training uh, in just echocardiography and have a clinical interest in sports and exercise cardiology. And I'll actually be staying at Mayo uh, for the next phase of my career and joining the staff uh, this time next year. It's a real honor to be here today and to see all of you. I know I'm competing with some pretty wonderful Minnesota weather, a rare rare, nice summer evening. So thank you for being here. Um, I'll plan to take some questions at the end just to make sure we keep things moving. We're gonna take a pretty thorough dive through the topic of pericarditis with a case-based approach. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. All right. So as I said, we'll be talking today about uh, the topic of pericarditis. Um, the learning objectives for today, uh, first, will be to comprehend the basics of diagnosis, testing, and therapeutic options for treatment of pericarditis. I want you really to grasp the importance of addressing a primary episode, but also an episode of recurrence. The next objective is to be familiar with high yield points of the 2015 ESC guidelines. You'll see me reference this document quite a bit throughout the talk, and it's a document I'd highly recommend that you download and keep in your files. And the last objective is to be able to apply the results of pivotal trials in the field of pericardial disease to your clinical practice. So we'll go through a total of about six trials um, of therapeutic importance and a couple of surgical trials as well. And we're going to do this through a case-based presentation. So this is the story of Mr. M. Uh, he is a 54-year-old male who has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and GERD. Uh, he presented initially to an outside emergency department in a small town in Minnesota and complained of two hours of constant substernal and subxiphoid chest achiness and pressure. He had noted to the ED staff that it worsened with Valsalva and with deep breathing, uh, and their documented physical exam was that of normal heart sounds. They noted epigastric tenderness to palpation, which was worse with sitting forward. Of course, like most patients who come to the emergency department, he gets an ECG. I won't spend too much time going over this ECG because for the most part, it's fairly unremarkable when thinking about a patient presenting with uh, chest pain. We'll take a quick look at his PA and lateral chest x-ray in here too. Uh, not much to comment on. A fairly normal cardiac silhouette, a slightly prominent aortic knob, but otherwise clear lungs, no effusions, um, and otherwise not really any notable acute findings. So during this initial ED visit, uh, they draw some labs. Note that he has a white blood cell count, which is slightly elevated at 12.4. And because of his presentation of chest pain, they check uh, two serial troponins, both of which are undetectable. They trial a GI cocktail, which is helpful, and the patient is actually dismissed home. Unfortunately, he comes back about five hours later. It's now about two or three o'clock in the morning um, and says he has worsening of the same symptoms that brought him in the first time. This is the repeat ECG that they get upon his representation to the ER. And here you can see uh, pretty noticeable ST elevations, which are fairly diffuse, but I would say uh, really initially caught my eye in the inferior leads. 
Given the concern about ST elevations, uh, the lack of clear reciprocal changes here may make you think about pericarditis, but the ED staff was sufficiently worried that they trialed a dose of nitroglycerin. This is his ECG after a dose of nitroglycerin. You can see that his heart rate has slowed quite impressively. He actually had an episode of a, essentially a vasovagal reaction to the sublingual nitroglycerin that they administered. With a slightly slower heart rate, you can again see the ST elevations, which are fairly diffuse. And again, no real notable reciprocal depressions. Um, the ED department was concerned about these ST elevations and actually alerted uh, a STEMI code for the patient, uh, which prompted him to get an emergency angiogram, which noted the presence of clean coronary arteries. Uh, and then he was admitted ultimately to the hospital for observation. That brings us really to the first question that we have to address is the diagnosis of pericarditis, which I think we all feel quite comfortable making in the kind of calm and quiet of our own office or at the computer, but when we're in the emergency room and having to assess a patient with ongoing chest pain who may have other risk factors for myocardial ischemia, I think really we have to ask ourselves, how do we know it's not a STEMI? And in this case, that was a very pertinent concern. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of ECG tips to help you parse out pericarditis versus STEMI. Really, any ST elevation that's less than five millimeters, ST segment concavity, or more extensive lead involvement with less prominent reciprocal ST segment depression, all of those should clue you in to the fact that this is probably a pericardial event and not myocardial ischemia. If you can find it, PR segment elevation and AVR and reciprocal PR depression in other leads is also a great clue to hang on to. Absence of Q waves. So again, just uh, understanding the patient and their history and the pretest probability. If there are no Q waves, then you know that there has not previously been a myocardial event. And so that would also clue you into the fact that perhaps ischemia is not the running symptom that you're dealing with. A shortened QT interval is something that's been reported, uh, albeit I think of less frequent observation. And I'll point you to a couple of other notable things just to keep in mind as you're reviewing ECGs. And first and foremost, that ECGs change throughout the course of presentation. So an initial acute pericarditis ECG will eventually look different as it translates into stage two, three, and four ECG changes with eventual normalization of the ECG. So it's important to keep that time course in mind as well. One uh, notable finding you may hear people talk about is spotic sign, and that's a downsloping TP segment, which you might be more likely to see in pericarditis. So the first thing I just want to draw your attention to and be mindful of as we go through the next few slides is the 2015 ESC guideline for the diagnosis and management of pericardial disease. This is really a fantastic guideline document, and I would highly recommend that you keep it in your files. Essentially, all of the major kind of therapeutic diagnostic steps that we're going to walk through today come straight out of this guideline. You'll see me use a lot of tables from this. I think contains a lot of really relevant clinical information as you're going through and trying to decide what to do with your patient and how to make the diagnosis and then effectively how to treat the patient. So when we talk about diagnosis, let's just all be on the same page. Um, you know, we talk about the diagnosis of pericarditis, but there really are some fairly clear and I think important uh, diagnostic guidelines with which we can talk about. Typical pericardial chest pain is something that you really want to spend the time parsing out of your patient's history. Um, pericardial chest pain is often pleuritic in nature. There's sometimes referral to the left shoulder or sometimes epigastric discomfort from diaphragmatic inflammation. A pericardial rub is certainly something you want to listen for. It's present in about 33% of patients. And so even though it's not highly prevalent, it is highly specific for pericarditis. And just a physical exam tip, you'll hear this best with the diaphragm and then lean the patient forward, bring that pericardium towards the anterior chest wall to hear this best. New widespread ST segment elevation and or PR depression notable on an ECG. And again, this isn't 100%. So uh, studies indicate that this is present in about 60% of patients. And then the presence of a pericardial effusion, whether it's new or worsening. And I think being mindful of the difference between just a teeny little physiologic effusion and a true new effusion is something certainly to be mindful of. And if there's prior studies from the same patient, it's an important factor to keep in mind. Technically, uh, the guidelines would say you need two of these four uh, diagnostic criteria to make the diagnosis of pericarditis, but there's certainly other things to keep in mind. There are supportive findings, so things like elevated inflammatory markers or pericardial inflammation on CT or cardiac MRI. Of course, you're not going to be getting a cardiac MRI on a patient in an emergency department, but certainly oftentimes those patients get CTs, and so that's an important thing you can look for on those studies. 
some red flags to be aware of. So certainly fevers, uh, the presence of a large effusion, obviously the presence of tamponade physiology. If there's a preceding history of chest wall trauma, so motor vehicle accidents or sports injuries, in patients who are immunosuppressed and may be at risk of atypical infections, those who are anticoagulated or those who have troponin elevation suggestive of concomitant myocarditis, those are red flags when you're making your diagnosis of acute pericarditis. So there are many causes of acute pericarditis and I am not gonna spend the time to go through this extensive list because I think we all can just kind of look at this and know that there's way too much here to memorize. But again, when you're thinking about your patient and trying to characterize what's going on and what are the next best steps, I think it's important to remember that in this part of the world, viral or idiopathic pericarditis are the most common causes of acute pericarditis. And of course, the viral and idiopathic diagnoses often blend together because many of the viruses that are causing pericarditis are common viruses that we all will eventually be infected with. And so checking you know, serologic markers uh, is often of very little to no yield. In the developing world, uh, tuberculosis remains the most common cause of pericarditis. So not something you may commonly see uh, in your patients in Minnesota or the upper Midwest, but it's certainly very important to keep in mind in your returning travelers or immigrant population or other people who've spent a significant amount of time outside of the country as in a very important, uh, important diagnosis to make right. On the right side, there's a couple of important things to note here, um, particularly our post-procedure patients, post-acute MI, aortic dissection, or patients who are post-op or post-procedure. So certainly uh, a new RV lead and a pacemaker can be the cause of a new effusion of pericardial symptoms or post-op, post-cardiac surgery. About 20% of patients will be post-op and develop pericarditis. So again, another common presenting patient characteristic. All right. So thinking about your diagnostic, diagnostic side, uh, the question of course is always, what other testing do I need? Um, certainly if you're seeing the patient in the ER, some of these labs will already be ordered for you, but I think it's best to go in equipped with the knowledge of what you are ordering or what else you need to complete the thorough workup. So here's a list. This is in no way prescriptive and exact or um, 100%. I'm sure people would have differing opinions on what they would recommend and order, but I think this is a really good uh, initial glance. A CBC, uh, an ESR and CRP is something I would highly recommend that you check uh, at baseline. A troponin, certainly to be mindful of myocardial involvement. Renal function, because it may influence your decisions about therapeutic options. And then of course, an INR, if the patient is therapeutic on their anticoagulation or you have other concerns about their coagulation profile. From a non-lab perspective, things like an ECG, absolutely a must with a low, uh, low threshold to repeat the ECG if there's any change in their clinical course, a chest x-ray, and then an echocardiogram. And that echo is something that I think we're always mindful of, but um, not always quite sure when and how to order it. And so again, I'll just turn you to this 2015 ESC guideline table, uh, which kind of clearly outlines their recommendations for the diagnostic uh, evaluation of acute pericarditis, and you can see that there is a class one level of evidence uh, supporting the use of ECG, echocardiography, x-ray, and then a couple of those basic labs in there too. So all of those essentially form the backbone of your initial workup. So there's certainly a lot of other ancillary testing you could order, and sometimes you should order. I'm not going to go through this list uh, comprehensively, but if you want to screenshot it or pull it up from the ESC guidelines at some point, again, this is knowing your patient, knowing their history, and knowing the situation that you're in, and thinking about other ancillary testing that may be important, particularly, let's say, patients who have autoimmune conditions, patients who are immunocompromised, or patients with other complex medical issues, where you may need to be thinking about other things, even things as simple as a TA. H, excuse me, a TSH, a thyroid function test, um, may actually be a very high yield test in the right patient. All right, so I'm an imager. Let's talk about the echo. What do I look for and what do I need to include when I'm the fellow writing the report on call? Uh, so certainly the first thing you're going to look for is the presence of a pericardial effusion. When you're looking at the presence of a pericardial effusion, uh, you're going to want to look at the size in diastole. And there are some guidelines on quantifying the amount of pericardial fluid, albeit those are certainly imperfect, but mild is typically less than 10 millimeters, moderate 10 to 20, and large is greater than 20 millimeters. This will be present in about 50 to 65% of patients presenting with acute pericarditis. And again, just be mindful if you have a patient who's had a small, a trace physiologic effusion in the past, and that hasn't changed, 
be careful about how you use that in the diagnosis and eventual follow-up of those patients because certainly uh, the misrepresentation of a physiologic effusion can be trouble down the line when you're looking for evidence of recurrence. If you can see a thickened pericardium on echo, that's a great thing to document, albeit sometimes that's a challenging assessment. Ventricular function, regional wall motion abnormalities, again, thinking about myocardial involvement, and then everybody's favorite, hemodynamics. So thinking about things like constriction, thinking about things like tamponade. And I know we are often taught as fellows here that if you're evaluating a patient for tamponade, if there's an effusion there, certainly you want to comment on the size of the effusion, but you're also going to want to be helpful to your proceduralist who's eventually going to tap that effusion and see if you can find some reasonable windows, let's say from a parasternal sub uh, whatever view you think is best for a potential approach for centesis will also be very informative down the road. One important pearl to keep in mind here is that about 40% of transthoracic echoes will be normal in patients with acute pericarditis. So if nothing looks amiss, don't be surprised. Uh, if you feel like your clinical history and your other diagnostic criteria are sufficient to make the diagnosis, a normal echo can be an expected finding. All right, so we'll go back to our case here. So if you remember, this is Mr. M who had presented to the emergency department initially with a couple hours of chest pain, had gone home after a GI cocktail was therapeutic and then came back with worsening chest pain, some ST elevation and ECG, which in retrospect was probably misattributed to coronary ischemia and is now spending the night in the hospital for observation. Uh, just to make sure that there's nothing else going on. He gets a transthoracic echo. You can see that there is a small effusion here you time out the marching of that atrial contraction and looking at the RV, there's really not any overt signs of tamponade here. So this was not tapped. LV function is normal. There are no regional wall motion abnormalities on this view or other views. And you can see at the hemodynamic assessment with the respirometer, that's the green line that's going up and down towards the bottom of each screen. Uh, this mitral inflow pattern really does not meet clear diagnostic criteria uh, for constrictive physiology or ventricular interdependence. So let's just talk about the tap. Um, we have Dr. Sinek phot photographed here. He is our pericardiocentesis expert here at the Mayo Clinic, and we rely on him a lot when we talk about patients with an effusion. And obviously, there's a lot of consternation that goes into this question of when do you tap an effusion? Certainly, if the patient has tamponade, that's a black and white issue. You know you need to act. But if the patient's not clearly in tamponade and you're getting your echo and you're having a hard time coming up with those diagnostic criteria, are there other situations when you may want to tap the effusion? Really, what he teaches us is to use your clinical history and your other test results to guide you. If it's a patient who's immunocompromised, who has risk factors for atypical infection, who you're concerned about purulent pericarditis, if there's another reason that you need to know what's in that pericardial fluid, that may be a, a great reason to tap outside of tamponade. And I would also say one of the things that Dr. Sinek teaches us is that if there are other signs of end organ dysfunction or hemodynamic compromise, if the patient is just not doing well, if their kidney function is not where it should be, if their liver function is starting to decline, if they're becoming a little bit hypotensive, sometimes you're not going to have a total slam dunk of tamponade, but if the clinical picture just doesn't feel right, then that's a situation when you should also be talking with your proceduralist about potentially proceeding with a centesis. If you do decide to get fluid, there's a great review paper by Dr. Lewis and Dr. Sinek of uh, techniques and appropriate testing for pericardiocentesis in practice. And I would say this is a, another great um, paper to keep in your files. Really, the basics are the basics here. And now when you get the fluid, you're often just sending for cultures, cytology, or hemoglobin and hematocrit. Um, rarely do we extend our testing beyond that. But again, I'll Go back to that line at the top. You have to use your clinical history and other test results to guide your therapeutics and management. All right, so let's go back to Mr. M. He's now in the hospital. So we get a little bit more information. Um, ESR is 71, his CRP is 51, and his troponin is undetectable. They elect to treat him with colchicine and ibuprofen. He ends up spending a night in observation. And the question becomes, do you keep him in the hospital for other testing or do you dismiss him home? And I think what we can all gather here is that there weren't any really other red flag symptoms. His inflammatory markers, his clinical history, his echo are all quite reassuring and fitting with that diagnosis of acute pericarditis. So really the next best step is to get him on an appropriate treatment regimen and decide how best to uh, triage his next therapeutic steps. So really when it comes to the question of who should be admitted to the hospital, there are some excellent guidelines outlined in that 2015 ESC document. 
Uh, recommendations for patients who are hospitalized, often those are patients who have fever, who have subacute onset, who have a particularly large effusion, or obviously those with tamponade, patients who failed outpatient treatment and really need uh, the next step in terms of pain control, patients who are immunosuppressed, uh, patients who have any sort of trauma preceding the finding of pericarditis, or those who use oral anticoagulants, those are all reasonable patients to think about inpatient management uh, for initiation of therapy and further diagnostic testing as you deem necessary. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is just define some terms. Uh, acknowledging fully that many of these terms are pretty arbitrary, but I think it's helpful to frame the discussion when we talk about how to treat patients and having a good vocabulary and kind of clear definitions of when we think about pericarditis and its duration. So when we talk about acute pericarditis, we're talking about symptoms that last usually less than four to six weeks. Incessant pericarditis is a phrase you may hear come up. That's symptoms lasting greater than four to six weeks, but less than three months without remission. Recurrent pericarditis is defined as a symptom-free interval of four to six weeks or longer. And chronic pericarditis is pericardial symptoms that last for more than three months. So again, these are not necessarily physiologically based. These are essentially to help you kind of describe the clinical situation. And again, I think going through these definitions is just outlining the importance of taking a very careful clinical history, acknowledging that for many patients, when we're getting into the issues of recurrent pericarditis or chronic pericarditis, this can very much so become kind of a chronic pain situation and outlining exactly the disease course can become challenging in the situations. One other term to be aware of, and you may hear it come up, particularly when we're talking about the echo findings, is effusive constrictive pericarditis. So that's the presence of constrictive physiology plus an effusion. Uh, some physical exam findings that may clue you into this would be things like an absent Y descent or an absent Kussmaul sign. And if it's a patient who you decide to bring for a pericardiocentesis, a patient whose right atrial pressures don't return to normal after pericardiocentesis is also a situation when you want to think about effusive constrictive pericarditis. Purulent pericarditis, this is a localized infection of the pericardial space with pus or microscopic purulence. And remember that not all infectious pericarditis is purulent and not all inflammatory pericardial fluid is infectious. So there's some important distinguishing features of each of those. And lastly, we mentioned Dressler syndrome very briefly in talking about the etiologies of pericarditis. This is, I think, in the modern reperfusion area in reality, a fairly rare outcome, um, but certainly something we all remember from step one. This is that autoimmune uh, mediated delayed pericarditis about two weeks after myocardial infarction. So again, not common to see, but certainly an important definition to have in your memory. And lastly, post-cardiac injury syndrome, or you'll hear people call it post-pericardiotomy syndrome. This just essentially refers to the patients who have prior injury or invasion into the pericardium, followed by usually a latent period of weeks to months before development of symptoms, though there's certainly a big spectrum of disease presentation in these patients as well. All right, so now that we've got our diagnostics down, we've defined some terms, we know about the etiology, let's talk a little bit about treatment of acute pericarditis. So the first step here is to talk about a couple of trials that pertain to the treatment of the initial episode of pericarditis. So we're going to talk about two trials in particular. They're conveniently named uh, similar names. The first one we'll talk about is the COPE trial. Uh, this is a trial from 2005 looking at the treatment of acute pericarditis with colchicine. This is an open label study of 120 patients with a first episode of idiopathic viral post pericardiotomy. Um, uh, caused uh, pericarditis. They are looking at aspirin or aspirin plus colchicine for a total of three months and using steroids only in those with contraindications to aspirin. The primary outcome that the COPE trial measured was recurrence of pericarditis at 18 months. The primary outcome was 10.7% versus 32.3%. So the aspirin plus colchicine group had a lower recurrence at 18 months. And this trial was one of the first to really outline that the use of steroids was an independent risk factor for recurrent episodes of pericarditis. So that's the COPE trial. The ICAP trial in 2013 actually just takes this really to the next step because this is now a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center trial of patients with a first episode of acute pericarditis. 
And here it's again, testing the effect efficacy of colchicine. So we are using colchicine plus an anti-inflammatory of choice or placebo plus an anti-inflammatory of choice. The primary outcome here is incessant or recurrent pericarditis. Remember those definitions we went through after their first episode. And you can see that those who were treated with colchicine had a much lower primary outcome event rate than those treated with the placebo plus an anti-inflammatory. I'll also note that those in the colchicine arm had a reduced rate of symptom persistence at 72 hours, so faster time to symptom improvement. They had a lower number of recurrences and a lower hospitalization rate, and there were actually no differences between the two groups in drug discontinuation. So the COPE and the ICAP trial really outline nicely the importance of colchicine in addition to anti-inflammatories in the treatment of a first episode of acute pericarditis. So here is your prescription prescription. When you are treating a first episode of acute pericarditis, the backbone of therapy is colchicine. You're looking for 0.5 to 1.2 milligrams in one or divided doses, and that is three months of therapy. The most common dose that we typically see is about 0.6 milligrams twice a day. That is in addition to ibuprofen, indomethacin, aspirin, or other NSAID, but these are by far and away the three most common. And you can see those are pretty hefty doses. And the duration of NSAID therapy is typically one to two weeks. So the colchicine therapy, three months, NSAIDs for one to two weeks. And then remember that you're treating patients with high doses of NSAIDs, that gastric protection is certainly not a bad idea. And do not forget that you are also going to need to counsel your patients about restricting physical activity beyond normal sedentary life until the resolution of symptoms and normalization of their inflammatory markers. Any excess heart rate or system, uh, systemic responses to exercise beyond normal sedentary life can perpetuate the inflammation and slow the time to recovery. This is especially critical when we think about our young patients presenting with acute pericarditis, your young athletic or highly active patients of course, those who want to exercise are always the ones who we can't get to stop exercising when they need to for medical reasons, but they are the ones who you really have to counsel carefully and really only returning to play once their symptoms have resolved and once their ECG, echo, and CRP are normalized. And there are some evidence-based guidelines that would say a minimum of three months is typically recommended. So essentially the time it takes you to use colchicine is the time that they should be staying away from play. A few notes on choosing your medications wisely. So choosing colchicine, you have to be mindful of age, weight, the presence of chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease. Uh, none of these are absolute contraindications, but are certainly a opportunity for you to discuss your pharmacist, the appropriate uh, dosing for your patient. Again, 0.6 BID is the dose we most commonly use here, uh, but that may vary depending on renal function and especially in your very small or elderly uh, frail patients. Keeping in mind too, that the cost of colchicine varies depending on the formulation you prescribe. So tablets are $70 and capsules are typically $200. Uh, so tablets are also um, distinct in their benefit in that they can be split. So depending on the dose that you choose, you may be able to offer your patients a much more affordable therapeutic option. As a cardiologist, you wanna be mindful of the drug interactions uh, specifically with verapamil. And then of course, we all remember learning about the horrible GI side effects of colchicine, namely uh, diarrhea can be a major concern. So when we're talking about treating a first occurrence, uh, a couple things to just think about. How often do you need to recheck your inflammatory markers? How often do you need to repeat your ECG? And do you need to repeat an echo at the end of therapy? I think the answer that I've gotten from many of our experts here is that again, you have to use your clinical situation to guide you. If you need to know that things are resolved before you can clear a young patient to go back to participating in athletics, then that's an important thing for you to think about at that three month mark as you're gonna be withdrawing colchicine. If it's a patient who's otherwise not particularly active in an otherwise, otherwise low risk situation, perhaps they had a normal echo at the beginning of therapy, then repeating many of these tests is not absolutely necessary. And again, just using your clinical judgment and knowing your patient and their situation is really gonna bring you to the best answer here. All right, so back to Mr. M. He's hospitalized for one night and then is appropriately dismissed home on colchicine, 0.6 milligrams BID for three months. He's given GI protection with esomeprazole 40 milligrams daily, and he's given a dose of ibuprofen, 600 milligrams TID for two weeks. His inflammatory markers are eventually followed up and do normalize, but unfortunately he comes back two months later with similar symptoms. So that brings us to this 
challenging concept of recurrent pericarditis. And unfortunately, it is challenging and not altogether uncommon. It will complicate about 20 to 30% of cases of initial episodes of acute pericarditis. And unfortunately, things just get worse. If you have a recurrence, the chance of re-recurrence then is greater than 50%. These presentations tend to be fairly stereotypic in that the signs, symptoms, diagnostic findings should not necessarily differ, whether it's first occurrence or second occurrence as compared to the initial episode. And although we love to talk about it in the echo lab, the reality is that constriction remains rare. It's only present in about 1% of patients. Most occurrences, recurrences, excuse me, will happen in the first 18 months. And the important thing to keep in mind here is that therapy is similar. So here is a snapshot from those ESC guidelines, just to orient you to what you're looking at here. This is essentially about first line, second line therapies for initial episode of acute pericarditis at the top. And then for your patients who continue on and have an episode of recurrent pericarditis, that's the second orange box about halfway down. And if you look at the recommendations for first line and second line therapy for first episode and recurrence, they are the same. So the importance of aspirin, colchicine, NSAIDs, exercise restriction, all of those still form the backbone of therapy. So if we're going to talk about therapy, we'll talk about two more trials in terms of aspirin and colchicine, and then we'll go on to discuss some of these other third line and fourth line therapies that you see listed here. So we had CORP and ICAP. Now we're going to have the CORE trial. So this is a trial looking at the first recurrence of pericarditis. This is a trial from 2005. This is a randomized open-label trial of patients with a first recurrence episode of pericarditis. And again, very similar to before, we're looking at the role of colchicine here. So it's colchicine plus, plus aspirin or placebo plus aspirin. Prednisone can be substituted here if there are uh, contraindications to aspirin. And the primary outcome here is a re-recurrence at 18 months. And those treated with colchicine had a lower rate of re-recurrence, 24% versus 50.6%. This also reduced the rate of symptom persistence at 72 hours. And again, we see that pattern that steroids are an independent risk factor for disease recurrence. Last but not least, in terms of colchicine, we'll come to the CORP trial. So it's a little bit of a tongue twister of colchicine trials, but I think important to know about all of them. This is a 2011 trial, which is 120 patients with a first recurrence of pericarditis. This is a random assignment trial, colchicine and aspirin or placebo plus aspirin. And again, looking at the re-recurrence rate at 18 months, 24 versus 55% with faster symptom resolution, lower hospitalization rates in the treatment arm. So again, we have evidence now for first-line therapy and recurrent episode. Colchicine is a medication that has to be in your armamentarium. So again, looking at the ESC guidelines here, you'll note the uh, drugs listed on the left, aspirin, ibuprofen, and dimethacin form your three most commonly prescribed NSAIDs. Appropriate doses and duration and tapering are prescribed here as well. And then colchicine rounding up the list at the bottom there. And you'll see though, that if we're talking about recurrent pericarditis, which this table is referring to, it's no longer three months, it's now six months of colchicine. So these can be quite protracted uh, courses of medications. All right, so here is the $6 million question that everyone's wondering then. I've seen patients treated with steroids for pericarditis. When do I need to use steroids or do I need to use steroids? So there is a role for the use of steroids in treating pericarditis, but you have to be very mindful of the situation of what you are in and what your patient is in. Steroids can be used for patients who fail colchicine and NSAIDs. And just to be clear, don't consider a patient a treatment failure if they have not yet completed their treatment course. So I think, again, being very mindful of what the expected timeline is and what the actual recommended timeline for therapy is. You know, if a patient ends up only getting five days of NSAIDs and two weeks of colchicine and has recurrent symptom, that is not the time to use steroids. You need to prescribe an appropriate course of therapy with aspirin, or excuse me, with NSAIDs and colchicine before you consider it a treatment failure. Patients who have intolerance or contraindications to aspirin or NSAIDs, so certainly patients who have chronic kidney disease, pregnant patients, uh, those are patients in which steroids will have to play a role. And patients with certain autoimmune conditions probably also benefit from steroids more so than patients uh, without autoimmune conditions, which are contributing to their pericardial inflammation. 
I think the big takeaway here is also knowing that if you find the right patient in the right situation in which you're going to use steroids, it's going to be a long treatment course. So if you look at this table seven from the ESC guidelines, you'll see a very long tapering schedule here. So you may start off at 50 milligrams, but then you are gonna be tapering down at 15 milligrams by 1.25 to 2. milligrams every two to six weeks. That is an incredibly long taper. And that's really key to making sure that you don't see that rebound pericardial inflammation that was seen in so many of the trials we talked about. So I'll briefly talk about immunotherapy. Uh, once it gets to this point, you are probably involving the knowledge and skills of an expert in pericardial disease. But I think it's very important to know about these new medications on the market. So there are two trials we'll talk about here. The first is the AirTrip trial. This is looking at the medication Anakinra, which is an interleukin beta-1 recombinant receptor antagonist. This is a small trial. So this is just 21 patients randomized, blinded withdrawal, and recurrent pericarditis. Uh, Anakinra reduced re-recurrences and facilitated discontinuation of steroids. So you can see on the uh, graph here on the right, on the y-axis is the proportion of patients uh, free of relapse. And you can see the Anakinra line at the top, uh, significantly different than the placebo line at the bottom after uh, really about 180 days of randomization, but that difference becomes very obvious very early on. There is another drug on the market, which you may hear about, that is Rolanacept, uh, which was uh, an interleukin 1 alpha and 1 beta cytokine trap. This is from the Rhapsody trial. This is also a small trial. It's just 61 patients, randomized blinded withdrawal in recurrent pericarditis. And Rolanacept was associated with a more expeditious resolution of symptoms and a decreased rate of re-recurrence. And you can see a very similar graph here on the right side of your screen with Rolanacept versus placebo. And this is the percent of patients with freedom from recurrence of pericarditis. Unfortunately, when we talk about managing immunotherapy, it's also not a short course. Uh, so Anakinra and Rolanacept really end up also having quite a protracted uh, prescription course. And you can see that treatment duration, uh, a longer duration was associated with more freedom from recurrence and a longer taper was associated with more freedom from recurrence. So again, kind of like steroids, this is not a quick start and stop medication. This ends up being a fairly protracted therapeutic course. All right, so let's go back to our patient. He's coming back to see you um, and a couple of months after a thorough evaluation and treatment of his pericarditis with an appropriate regimen of medications. And he comes back with recurrent episodes of chest discomfort you get a new set of labs and note that his inflammatory markers are again elevated. And here is his repeat echo. So this is the Mayo format. So I apologize. The left ventricle is on the left side of your screen and the right ventricle is on the right. But I think what is blatantly obvious here is that there is very abnormal septal motion and clear evidence of ventricular interdependence. And so your initial concern here should certainly be an absence of effusion, things like pericardial constriction. All right, so here we're going to go to another one of our experts here. This is Dr. J.O., who is our resident expert in echocardiography and all things constriction. So what do we do if we see constriction? Really, the first question should be, is the constriction that you see, is it inflammatory or is it fibrotic? Not all constriction is equal. Inflammatory constriction, so kind of like our patients, if you're coming in and your inflammatory markers are elevated, those patients may actually have improvement in their constrictive physiology if you treat the inflammation with medications. Unfortunately, those that do not have evidence of inflammation and have fibrotic constriction, that requires an anatomic solution. So an anatomic solution needs an, an or excuse me, an anatomic problem will need an anatomic solution, but if it's an inflammatory uh, issue, certainly a trial of anti-inflammatories would be a reasonable first attempt. Unfortunately, for many patients um, who we see here as a referral center, surgery is something that we end up talking about. Um, and patients who are sent for uh, cardiac surgery in the setting of complications of pericarditis, um, really the question is, when do you refer them? Patients who have recurrent episodes of acute pericarditis represent one group of patients who go for pericardiectomy. Patients who have fibrotic pericardial constriction, in other words, that anatomic problem that needs an anatomic solution, or patients who have recurrent pericardial effusions that require repeated pericardiocentesis may also be good candidates for a surgical pericardiectomy. 
You can see in this pie chart on the right, this is the various etiologies of constrictive pericarditis seen uh, among 500 patients or so who underwent pericardiectomy here at Mayo Clinic, and noting that post-cardiac surgery, idiopathic, and acute pericardio pericarditis are the most common complications, but certainly patients with complicated histories, things like radiation, heart disease, and malignancy also make up a not uh, insignificant minority. Let's see here. Snapped out of presentation. Again. All right. So when we talk about surgical pericardiectomy, I think it's important to know that pericardiectomy has a very important role in treating patients with complicated courses of relapsing pericarditis. This is a study from our institution looking at survival and then event-free survival in patients with relapsing pericarditis. Patients who were sent for pericardiectomy did not necessarily do any better in terms of survival, but did have a much better event-free survival over the course of many years after cardiac surgery. So really, this can be a very effective therapeutic option for patients who are appropriately selected. Just a brief word, since this is a cardiology conference and not all of us are super familiar with what happens down in the OR, when we talk about pericardiectomy, this is not talking about a pericardial window or a limited pericardiectomy. The best approach is to take away as much of the offending pericardium as possible. So that's a radical pericardiectomy. This needs to happen in the hands of a skilled surgeon because there are certainly delicate structures in and around the pericardium that can be damaged, notably things like the phrenic nerve. And also patients who have a lot of fibrosis, even a lot of calcification, extracting that pericardium can be extremely challenging, but the more you get out, the better. All right, going back to our patient, uh, ultimately he had what we thought was inflammatory constriction. He was treated with anti-inflammatories and immunotherapy. So again, if you think there's an inflammatory component, reasonable to start with a medication-based first approach to target the inflammation. Unfortunately for him, the constrictive physiology failed to improve. And so he was ultimately sent for radical pericardiectomy. And at last follow-up, uh, several months post-op, he was doing much better, uh, feeling much more um, less winded, uh, no significant chest discomfort. He was a very active guy to begin with. And I think <laughs> I remember it being very challenging to counsel him about activity restriction. And so this was really a, a rather liberating surgery and a successful surgical outcome for him. All right, so we spent uh, quite a while now talking about all things pericarditis. What are the takeaway points? Knowing that you're only gonna remember a couple of things out of this talk. First and foremost, when you're making the diagnosis, as with so many things in cardiology, rely on your clinical history. That is really going to form the backbone of making an accurate and timely diagnosis of pericarditis. When it comes to treatment, use those ESC guidelines. There's great information in there. And remember, don't stop therapy early. When it comes to follow-up and long-term, properly counsel your patients on the risk of recurrence. Make sure you're utilizing appropriate therapy for recurrence and remembering the slightly different timelines for a recurrent episode versus a first episode. And then always knowing when to ask about, is pericardiocentesis appropriate, is immunotherapy appropriate, and is surgery appropriate? Hopefully we've given you some background information which can be helpful in making some of those decisions. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground. Here are the references that I think are, are most relevant for today's talk, and I'm going to star four of them because I think these are four papers which should, should be in your files as a cardiology fellow. They are things that I have referenced over and over again, whether on echo call or seeing patients in clinic, uh, or if you get looped into doing a pericardiocentesis, quickly reviewing some of those patients and papers beforehand can be extremely helpful. To give a special thanks to Dr. Lewis, uh, Tim Roach, who's one of our cardiac pharmacists here, and Dr. Shireen, who is one of our former fellows and now we practice in the Chicago area. They were all extremely helpful in putting this talk together. And I think with that, I will pause for questions. I see that there's a couple in the chat, uh, which I will start with. And you know, it looks like those are not questions. Those are announcements from Claire. Um, so if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm going to unshare my screen, and then you can go ahead and raise your hand, and ideally, I'm going to be able to help um, pick on people, or if you want to put uh, any comments or questions in the chat, I would be more than happy to answer any questions.
All right. If there are no other questions, I'm going to throw my email in here. So if you guys think of anything afterwards, um, feel free to send me an email with any questions. Uh, I can always lean on some of our experts here uh, to give you some good answers too. I know these can be particularly challenging patients to take care of and clinical situations, uh, challenging echocardiographic diagnoses. So hopefully this will provide some good uh, basic introduction as you guys get started on the academic year. Otherwise, get out and enjoy the lovely Minnesota evening. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Larson. And uh, again, be sure to register for the next uh, lecture and if you did, if any of your colleagues missed this, uh, we will have the recording. So thank you everyone. Have a good evening.